Good morning, Saddleback. It's good to see you, and you look great. If you'll open your Bibles and take out your message notes, we're gonna look at making the most of opportunities that God gives you this week. You know, every time I look out on your faces, I just think this is the most amazing church I have ever seen on the planet, in the galaxy, in the universe. Maybe, maybe in another universe there might be another great church. But I'm absolutely convinced because nobody loves like you guys do. You love God with all your heart. You love each other. You love our pastors. No church has a bigger heart for the world in 2,000 years of history. No church in 2,000 years has sent more members to more countries and more places to do more than you. 23,000 members of our church have gone to 197 countries. That's an amazing thing. That is an amazing thing. And I just, I just want you to know what a privilege it is to be your pastor. And I, I consider it a great, great joy and a great honor. By the way, what does a pastor do? I don't know. Pastors are really like spiritual coaches. You know, you know that you get healthier and stronger if you work with a partner for working out. You get healthier and stronger, you're more consistent if you've got a coach in anything. Doesn't matter if you're a pro, if you're a pro golfer, pro basketball player, a, a pro singer, even great singers have coaches. Everybody needs coaches in your life. And it's my job to coach you spiritually to make sure you're spiritually fit. And my deepest desire, really, from the bottom of my heart, my deepest desire is that you will live a life that makes God smile. That you will live a life that brings glory to God. That you live a life that you're not ashamed when you stand before him one day when you say, I made the most of what you gave me. I want you to be great. I want you to be a great woman I want you to be a great man. Now greatness doesn't mean famous, it means great. And my goal is that you will live a great life, you will make a great impact with your life, and that you will become a great soul. That's really what I, I wanna see happen in your life. Most people waste their lives in trivia and pettiness and they get to the end of their life and they go, is that it? That's all there was to my life. You see, greatness is not automatic. It is the result of decisions that you make. Nobody is born great. Hate to tell you this, all these pop psychology books that says you're born great. No, you're not born great. You're born pooping and slobbering. Okay, no baby is great, okay? But you're born to become great. You were born to become great, and that is your choice. Greatness is a matter of choice. Whether you live a great life, whether you make a great impact, and whether you build a great soul, it's all up to you. You can waste your life if you want to. But my job as a spiritual coach, as your pastor, is to help you realize that greatness is not a matter of great talent. It's a matter of great choices. I know lots of people have great talent that totally blew their lives. Wasted it, spent it, you know, on, on things that really didn't even matter at all. They had great talent, great talent's a dime a dozen. Lots of people have great talent. It's not the people who have great talent that are great in life, it's the people who make great choices. And there are really three choices you have to make if you're gonna live a great life, make a great impact, and, and build a great soul. I wrote them there at the top of your outline and I'm gonna talk in depth about one of these uh, today. But the first thing you have to do is you have to have a great purpose to live for, and then you have to have a great people to team up with, and then you have to have great opportunities to use what God gave you. Let me explain this for just a second. This is kind of an introduction here. The first thing, if you're gonna have a, a great life, is you must commit your life, you must give your life to a great purpose. You must give your life to a purpose greater than yourself. You will never be great living for yourself. Anybody can live a self-centered life. Anybody can live a selfish life. In fact, most people do. To be great, you must give your life away to something greater than your life. The, Jesus said, 
you'll only know how to really live if you learn to give your life away. You need something bigger than yourself to get out of bed for. You need something greater than yourself. And great people are just ordinary people who commit to great purposes. That's why we call Saddleback a purpose-driven per church. And we talk about living a purpose-driven life. It's all about living for something greater than ourselves. Now, many, many years ago, when I was about the age of the students here on stage, I made a decision as a high school student that I was gonna figure out what was the greatest purpose in life, and then I was gonna give the rest of my life to that great purpose. I could save you some time. I could save you the search. Because the greatest purpose in life is God's purpose for your life, God's will for your life, God's plan for the whole world. The greatest purpose in the world is God's family. Now, it's called the kingdom of God, it's called the flock, it's called the family, it's called the new community, it's called the church. Most people, when they think of the word church, they think of a building or, or a meeting. But church is not something you go to, church is something you're a part of. The church is the family of God, and the Bible says God created the entire world for one reason. God had created the entire universe for one reason. God wanted a family. And history is all about God gathering people who he put us on earth and gives us a choice to choose to love him or not love him, to choose to obey him or not obey him, follow him or not follow him. God knew that a certain number of people would choose to obey him and love him and follow him, and they're gonna be a part of his family forever. This world only lasts a while, but eternity lasts forever. One day there's not gonna be a Microsoft. One day there's not gonna be an Apple Corporation or Starbucks. One day there's not gonna be the United States of America. One day there's not going to be the world as we see it. But the only thing that's gonna last on this planet are the people who are part of God's family, the church. So if you bet on the church, if you invest in God's family, if you bet on the kingdom of God, you're betting on a sure thing because it's the only thing that's gonna last. Fame doesn't last, money doesn't last, your health doesn't last, but the will and the plan and purpose of God is gonna last forever. So God is gathering a family to be with him, and it's inevitable. In fact, here's what the Bible says. Look up here on the screen. Matthew 24, 14. The good news about God's kingdom will be preached in all the world to every nation, and then the end will come. That's what Jesus said. I figure he knows more about it than you or me. And so the history is moving toward a climax when the last person that God knows is gonna be a part of his family going to be a part of the church, has said, yep, I'm in, bam, it's over, and we're out of here, and this phase of eternity is done with. So you got to give yourself to something greater. Give yourself to something that lasts, and that is God's plan and purpose and his family. Then the second thing you have to do to be a great person is you have to do it with other people. You can't do it by yourself. You must join great people committed to the same purpose. Here at Saddleback Church, we have one group that are committed to that same purpose. There are many great churches. Just find a spiritual family and say, that's gonna be my family, and we are committed to the purposes of God. First Corinthians chapter three says this on the screen. We work together as partners who belong to God. Most people don't realize that the biggest thing on the planet is the Christian church. There are 2.3 billion church members, Christian church members in the world. That's one out of every three people. The church is bigger than the United States. The church is bigger than China. The church is bigger than Europe. It is the biggest thing on the planet. The family of God is why God created the earth. So you need to get attached to a family. And we have a class here called 101. You could join this church family. But then the third thing you need, first you need a great purpose, second you need great people that you connect with, team up with, and the third thing you need is great opportunities. Now great opportunities are all around you, you just don't know how to see them. You don't know how to sense them, you don't know how to sift them, you don't know how to select them, and you don't know how to seize them. This is a skill you can learn and I want us to talk about it today. And in this vision weekend, I want us to talk about you getting a vision for the opportunities around you. The Bible says this, they're on your outline, make the most of every opportunity for doing good. Make the most of every opportunity. That's a command from God. You are to make the most 
of every opportunity for doing good. By the way, it says dot, dot, dot. You know what the rest of that verse says? In these evil days. Success is the management of opportunities. You don't get any opportunities, you're not gonna be a success. The problem is not the lack of opportunity. The problem is you don't see them, you don't sense them, you don't sift them, you don't sort them, and you don't seize them. There are opportunities all around you for greatness every day, literally every single day. What you have to do is to be able to get the skill of managing those opportunities. You gotta have great purpose in your life, you got to have great people around your life that you team up with, that's called your church family, and then you've got to have the great opportunities to develop your talents and your gifts and your abilities. It is a skill you can learn. When I started out in this, I was pretty bad at it. I missed all kinds of great opportunities. I'm pretty good at it today. I'm, I'm pretty good at seeing opportunities that other people don't see. And I go, oh, we can use that, we can do that. And learning how to jump on it and get there. So what I wanna do is share with you six things that I've learned about opportunities from God's word over the last 30, 40 years. Would you write these down? Six things I've learned. Number one, I must say no to good opportunities in order to say yes to great ones. I must say no to good opportunities so I can say yes to great ones. You don't have time to do everything. God doesn't expect you to do everything. Not everything is worth doing in the first place. Mo many of you know, if you've been around Saddleback, that I've had nine mentors in my life. Older men who trained me in different areas and I got them for different things uh, to teach me different. One of the nine mentors was the father of modern management, Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker trained most of the CEOs of the major corporations of the last generation. He was the most brilliant business mind on planet Earth. And for the last 20 years of his life, he was my mentor. And I would go to his house and sit at his feet and just listen and ask him questions. And as a young pastor, when I'd go to see Peter, he died on, uh, when he was 95, 96. Um, as a young pastor, I would go to see him and when I'd walk in the door, he would always say, Rick, before you tell me the new thing that you wanna start doing, tell me what you've stopped doing. He made me do that every time. You can't keep adding things to your schedule without cutting things out. You load so many things on your boat, the boat sinks. You put so many irons in the fire, you put the fire out. You burn the candle at both ends, you're not as bright as you think you are. <laughs> and so un being able to take advantage of great opportunities first means knowing what I should stop doing simplifying, clarifying, taking some things out of my life to go, I don't have time for that. That's not making me a great person. That's not building a great soul. It's not making great impact. It's not even causing me to live a great life. Why in the world am I wasting time on that? And so just because it's good doesn't mean you should do it. Not all opportunities are good ones. And even good ones doesn't, doesn't mean you should do them all. Some opportunities are temptations. Some opportunities are uh, diversions. Some opportunities are detours from your purpose. Some opportunities are total distractions. Jesus uh, said to not look back. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 7 says this. I want you to do whatever will help you serve the Lord best with, notice, as few distractions as possible. You might circle that. God wants you to live your life with as few distractions as possible. You can't be a great man, you can't be a great woman if you're distracted all the time by little things. So I've gotta say no to good opportunities to say yes to great ones. That means, number two, second thing I've learned is that every opportunity must be evaluated. Every opportunity to use your time, to use your money, to use your energy, to use your influence, to use your words, every opportunity must be evaluated. It's always amazed me that when God set the Jewish nation free from slavery in Egypt and Moses leads them out of Egypt in the great exodus and they're going back to their homeland, the promised land where God had given them hundreds of years before, when they come back to the promised land, it had been their land, then they lost it and now they're getting it back. And God says, I'm gonna give it back to you. Moses sends in 12 spies to check out the land. Why in the world did he need to spy it out? Hadn't God already said, I'm gonna give you this land? 
What did it matter who was living there now? Because God had already promised it. Why didn't you spy it out? Because you need to even check out the opportunities that God gives you. So let me give you five questions that I've begun to use in my life over the years to evaluate opportunities. You might write these five questions out. Here's how you know, should I go for this or not? A business opportunity, uh, a school opportunity, a relationship opportunity, five questions. Number one, what do I need to know and who knows it? That's the first question you ask. What do I need to know and who knows it? Do you know that 75% of all new businesses fail within the first five years? 75% of all new businesses fail. Why? Because they don't know what they need to know before they start and they don't even know who knows it. They just think they like an idea like, I like bagels, I like donuts, so I'm gonna start a donut shop. Sorry, just because you like donuts doesn't mean you should be in the donut business. Before you ever start a donut shop, you should go talk to donut shop owners and find out what's the upside and the downside and find out everything you need to know first. Before I started Saddleback Church, I talked to every pastor in this area before I even moved here. Wrote them letters and asked them about the area. He said, well, I'd like to go start a software company. Well, how many software companies have failed? You need to know, what do I need to know first and who knows it? You know, I like to bake pies. I think I'm gonna go start a pie business. Really? Just because you like to bake pies doesn't mean you're gonna have a successful business at it. You need to know, who do I need to know and what do they know that I don't know? Let me show you some verses. Proverbs 18, 13. It's stupid to decide before knowing the facts. That's what the Bible says. Proverbs 15, 22. Get all the advice you can and you'll, and, and you'll succeed. Without it, you'll fail. You need to get a bunch, you're getting, being considered for a new job, they're interviewing you, you should be interviewing somebody. Find out what is it like to work at this place. Look at this verse on the screen. The Bible says in Proverbs 11:14, 14, with many counselors there is safety. What do I need to know and who knows it? Second question you need to ask to evaluate opportunities in your life is this. What might be the unintended consequences? What might be the unintended consequences of this decision? You know, I think I'm gonna sell everything and move back to such and such place. Really? What might be the unintended consequences on your life, your health, your family, kids, other people, relatives, your future? There are consequences to every decision you make. To not know those consequences in advance, both good and bad, is dumb. You, to every upside, there's a downside. Now you don't say no to an idea just because it's got some negative consequences to it. I make decisions all the time that have negative consequences. I'm simply willing to live with those consequences. But not knowing them in, in advance is not smart, it's not wise. The Bible says this in Proverbs 22 verse three. A prudent man, that's a wise person, foresees the difficulties ahead. That's forecasting. Foresees the difficulties ahead and prepares for them. Circle the word prepare. A prudent man foresees the difficulties ahead and prepares for them. A fool goes blindly on and suffers the consequences. Just because you've got a great idea doesn't mean you should do it. I got a great idea, we're gonna go do this. Have you thought about the unforeseen, unintended consequences? What the Bible says is this. Expect the best and plan for the worst. You might write that down. Expect the best and prepare for the worst. Expect the best means faith. I, I have optimism, I have faith, I believe, I'm trusting God to help me. I expect the best, but I'm also prepared for the worst. If you're gonna go on a backpacking a trip, you better prepare for the worst to happen in your backpack. Because it might, because we live in a broken world. And so the Bible says, a prudent man foresees the difficulty and prepares for him. This is called scenario planning. The company most famous for it in the world is Royal Shell, the, the Shell gas station company. They, they were the ones who pioneered scenario planning. And it says, if this happens, we'll do this. And if this happens, we'll do this. And if this happens, we'll do this. And they think they invented it. Actually, Scenario Planet is in the book of James, chapter four, thousands of years ago. 
where James says, you should never say, next year we're gonna do this, and we're gonna go to this city, and we're gonna buy this business, and we're gonna build this house. You should say, next year, if it is the Lord's will, we're gonna buy this, build this, we're gonna go there, and there's always a little catch. Say, God, we're making our plans, but ultimately, it's in your hand. Because none of us know the future. Now the Bible says it's a good thing to plan. In the book of Proverbs, there are many, many verses. If you wanna to learn to be a planner, study the book of Proverbs. And it says we should make our plans counting on God to direct us. But there's also a verse in the Bible in Jeremiah which says no man can plan his life. Why? Because you have never had a plan that went perfectly, ever, in your life. Unless it was a one-step plan. I'm gonna to go to the bathroom. Okay, okay, that, that one might work. But any plan with more than about five or six steps, you live in a broken planet. Nothing ever works like you planned it. You might get 80% there. And so you hold your plans with an open arm and you say, what might be the unintended consequences? Look at this verse on the screen, Proverbs 14, 16. The wise are cautious and they avoid danger. They see it in advance. Fools plunge ahead with great confidence. Orange County is filled with entrepreneurs who are fools who plunged ahead with great confidence and lost their shirt because they didn't, they, they saw an opportunity, but they didn't know how to sift it. They didn't know how to sort it. They didn't know how to select it. They didn't know how to evaluate it. Now there are three more questions and Tom, Pastor Tom's gonna come and share those questions. The next one is, what's my motivation? And your motivation is important because God's growing you. He's more concerned about why you do what you do than what you do because he's working in us to uh, give us a life of purpose, give us a life of greatness. And so the Bible says in Proverbs 2, 3, here's the motivation to stay away from in, in uh, Philippians 2, 3, never let, never let selfishness or pride be your guide when you do things. So you look and you say, am I doing this out of selfishness? Am I doing this out of ego? Am I doing this out of pride? Am I doing this to prove to them that I'm right? To prove to them that I'm great? Am, am I doing this to get the fame, to get the money? Is that my main motivation? The Bible says never let that be your main motivation. Re recognize, as Rick said earlier, there's a huge difference between fame and greatness. And you may get some measure of fame in your life, I don't know, but there's no greatness in fame. There's a huge difference between being a celebrity and being a hero, living, living a heroic, great life. A huge difference. When you think about sports stars, they're celebrities, most of them, but they're not heroes for what they do on the sports field, for hitting a home run or catching a touchdown. That's a great thing that they do in that moment, but it's not heroic. They do it because they love to play the game. They do it because it makes them a lot of money. They, they do it because maybe it brings them some fame. There's no heroism in that. Now, they might be heroic if they go out and make a difference in the community, selflessly. They make a difference that none of you know about. That's where the real heroism comes. So you and I have to look at our lives and say, why am I doing it? What's the motivation? Is it for the money? Is it for the fame? Is it just for my personal enjoyment? Those motivations don't last. The motivation that lasts, the motivation of greatness is, how can I give myself selflessly to other people? How can I sacrifice for other people? Now, the truth is, sometimes we want something so much, I wanna prove that I'm right, I, I, I wanna get this prideful thing of fame and motivation because they got it, that we sometimes think that's our calling. It's not our calling, it's just a need. That's why you have to evaluate. Is this my personal need or is this God's calling in my life? Here's a great verse. Jesus, Matthew 16, 24 said, if you wanna be my follower, you must put aside your selfish ambition Shoulder your cross and then follow me. That's a great life. Are you willing to do that? That's living a truly great life. That's what you evaluate as you evaluate your life and calling. The fourth question is, does it fit? Does this fit my purpose and my calling? Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, anyone who lets himself be distracted from the work that I planned for him is not fit for the kingdom of God. Now, there's a lot of things that can distract you from the work that God has planned for you, from, from God's purpose for your life. You know one of the main things that distracts you from God's purpose for your life? The way you see God's purpose working out in other people's lives. You look at him, you look at her, and you go, well, that's pretty cool. I'd like to be like that. 
that's pretty cool. I'd like to be like that. Well, God has them doing it. Why would he have you doing the same thing that they're doing? He has a different purpose. He has a different calling in your life. So don't be distracted by wanting to be like somebody else. Be the person that God's made you to be. And when you do that, Isaiah 26, 3 says, you, Lord, give perfect peace to those who keep their purpose firm and put their trust in you. When you are living God's purpose for your life, you have a peace in your life like you've never had before. If you're anxious all the time, if you're nervous all the time, one of the reasons might be you're trying to live somebody else's purpose, somebody else's calling. Maybe the calling your parents had for you when you were growing up, or maybe somebody that you see around you and you want to be like them. What's God's purpose for your life? What fits your life. Just because a shirt fits somebody else doesn't mean it's going to fit you, right? Just because a purpose fits somebody else's life doesn't mean it's God's purpose for your life. So Ephesians 4.1 says this. I, I want to say, just look at me. I want to say this to you. I beg you to live a life that is worthy of your calling because you have been called by God. Every single one of us. You have been called by God. You have a unique purpose and calling for your life. God can do something great through your life that he doesn't intend to do or cannot do through anyone else's life. It doesn't matter whether anyone else notices or not. God has that calling for your life. Now, as Rick said earlier, one of our jobs is to be your coach in that, to help you to discover what is that purpose and calling that fits my life. So we have something called class at Saddleback, 101, 201. Class 301 is where you discover your shape. But you gotta go to 101 and 201 first to figure out how to discover your shape. If you haven't been to any of those classes, next weekend at Saddleback is a what we call a super class Sunday. We're teaching all of them. If you haven't been to 301 yet, you've already been to 201, especially I'm talking to you, go to 301. It's where you discover your purpose and calling. Does it fit my purpose and calling? Then there's a fifth question you ask, and that is, is this the best use of my time and energy? Is this the best use of my time and energy? 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says, everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Not everything is constructive in life. There's some things that you could do in life that are permissible. You could watch TV 10 hours a day. You could watch YouTube videos 10 hours a day, and they might be good YouTube videos, good shows on TV, but 10 hours a day, it might be permissible, but it's sure not beneficial, it's sure not constructive. God's just given me and you one life to live. We've got these few hours and few minutes in this life. What's the best use I can make of it? What's the best use I can make of the time that God has given me? When you start to evaluate that way, you throw out the second bests, so that you can focus on the best. That's part of the process of evaluation is you're gonna to have to throw out some second bests to focus on the best in life as you evaluate what's God's purpose for my life. Now, opportunities don't warn you in advance. And so the third thing that I've learned is this. Opportunities come when I least expect them. They don't send you an advance warning. They don't write you a letter in advance. They just show up. And as a result of that, you have to be ready at all times in order to take advantage of opportunities that God puts in front of you. Sometimes God puts an opportunity that is literally life-changing right in front of you and you can miss it and your life doesn't get changed. This next week, there might be an opportunity that shows up that you've been waiting for your entire life. You've been waiting 20 years, 40 years, 60 years for this opportunity, and it shows up, but because you're busy, you don't see it. And because you're, 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 you're not ready, you're not prepared, you're not, gonna, you're not gonna be able to take advantage of it. Jesus said in Luke 9, 62, excuse me, in Matthew 24, 44, you must be ready all the time, for I will come when least expected. He's talking about coming back. Do you know, I once did a study, maybe I'll share it with you sometime, uh, on the 12 things the Bible says we're supposed to always be ready for. And 12 times in the scripture it says, always be ready for this, always be ready for this, always be ready for this, always be ready for this. There are 12 different times in scripture. Well, one of them was the one we just read where Jesus said, be ready because I'm gonna come back sometime. So you're to always be prepared. If you're not prepared, you'll miss an opportunity. There's the guy in the Bible named Joseph, who as a young man has this dream that he is one day gonna be a great man. In fact, he's gonna save nations. 
He has this amazing dream, and it is true, but the next 40 years of his life goes the exact opposite way. His brothers are jealous of him. They sell him off to slavers. They throw him into a pit. Uh, he's taken down to a foreign country. He's sold into slavery. Uh, he's then falsely accused of rape, thrown in prison. Everything goes wrong in his life for 40 years. Some of you could relate to that. And the dream you had as a young person, you're nowhere near it. And he was sitting, rotting away in a prison. But one day, at the right time, Pharaoh, the king of Israel, I mean of Egypt, has a dream and they said, does anybody know how to interpret these things? They said, well, there's a really spiritual guy in prison. His name's Joseph. He might be able to help. And they bring Joseph. They said, you think you can inter interpret the Pharaoh's dream? He goes, well, I'll give it a try. And he does. And he interprets correctly. And Pharaoh raises him up to be second in command, the most second most powerful man in the entire world at that time. This guy goes from the pit to the palace in 24 hours. Why? Because he was prepared. He was ready. And when they said, can you do this? They said, sure, why not? Why not? In 24 hours, he goes from the pit to the palace. God can do more in your life in 24 hours than you can do in 40 years of career scheming and manipulating. Places you think you I've always wanted to be, and you think, I'm never getting there. Well, are you ready for the opportunity if God has prepared you? The Bible says, I have to be ready and expect them. 2 Timothy 2.21 says this. All who make themselves clean from evil will be used for special purposes. Now, what does that mean, all who make themselves clean from evil? It means I keep short accounts of God. It doesn't mean I'm perfect. It means that when I blow it, when I make a mistake, when I sin, I just quickly admit it to God. This is like spiritual breathing. I admit it, I confess it. I admit it, I confess it. I admit it, I confess it. God, I, I was mean to my wife just now. Please forgive me and ask forgiveness for my wife. I said the wrong thing to those people. God, I just lied just then. I'm sorry. God, that was an arrogant attitude. God, that was jealousy just then. You don't let it pile up in your life. You keep short accounts of God. You're not gonna be perfect, but you can be clean. And you be clean by confessing to God every time you make a mistake. You don't hold on to it. How do you know you're holding on to it? You still feel guilty. You still feel guilty. You haven't confessed it. The Bible says he's faithful to forgive us when we confess it. All who make themselves clean, in other words, that's one of the ways you get ready for opportunity. God couldn't use some of you because you got a bunch of unresolved junk in your life that you've never confessed to God. You need to confess it and get clean so then you're ready to be used. All who make themselves clean will be used for special purposes. They will be made holy, useful to the master, ready, there's that word, ready to do any good work. That means being ready for the opportunity when I least expect it. Now the fourth thing I've learned is this. I must stay flexible to be ready. When God has opportunities for your life or my life, we have to stay flexible and be ready to change, be ready to turn on a dime. One of the reasons God blesses Saddleback Church is it's a very flexible church. It was grained into our culture in the early years when we used 79 different buildings in the first 13 years. We kept moving around and we used to say, if you figure out where we are this week, you get to come. That created a very flexible culture. And you know, I'm Pastor Gumby. I mean, we can just bend, we move, we, we turn, we add, we drop, we, we change all the time. We don't say, well, one of the phrases you're never gonna hear in this church is, we've always done it that way. Well, I call that the seven last words of the church. We've always done it that way. And, and he said, why do you do it? Well, I don't know, we've just always done it that way. You have to be flexible. Galatians 5.25 says this. Since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. A good example of this means you don't get ahead of God and you don't get behind God. You're just walking at the same pace with God. So God, I'm just gonna walk with you. I'm gonna go as far as you can, uh, as fast or as slow as you go. There's lots of examples of this in Scripture, but the Bible says in Proverbs 10, verse five, make hay while the sun shines. In other words, when an opportunity comes, you better take advantage of it because it's not gonna stay there. 
Opportunities are like problems. They pass through your life. They don't come to stay, they come to pass. No problem stays and no opportunity stays. You got a window of opportunity for a limited time only. So you've got to be able to be flexible and go, whoa, look at that opportunity. This was where I was planning to go, but this opportunity just opened up. God just gave me this great opportunity. We're going that way. And you've got to be willing to let go of your plan and move toward God's opportunities just given you. Now there are three causes I've learned watching people that cause people to miss opportunities. You might write these down. The three causes, number one is inflexibility and unwillingness to change. We don't like to change. We like what we are doing and we wanna keep doing it. And we get stuck in attitudes and like a rut. At, bad attitudes are like diapers. They have to be changed or they start stinking. Okay, so you, you just can't keep holding on to it. But you, you, gotta, you gotta let it go. Inflexibility, Proverbs 13, 19 says, it's pleasant to see our plans develop. Now let me stop there. Oh, we love to make plans. Some of you, you're making plans for Halloween, you're making plans for Thanksgiving, you're gonna have plans for Christmas, plans for New Year's, fine, go ahead and make all your plans. But the Bible says, it's pleasant to see our plans develop. That's why fools refuse to give them up even when they're wrong. Hmm. That's why a lot of people miss opportunities, they never become great. Because they made their little plan for their life. I wanna tell you, your plan for your life is smaller than God's plan for your life. Your plan is dinkier, it's punier. It's not nearly as big as God's plan for your life is. You're not thinking as big as God is thinking for your life. And so you've got to say, I'm willing to lay aside my plan and he says, fools refuse to give them up even when they're wrong, inflexibility. Second cause of a missing an opportunity is busyness. Busyness, we get so busy. One time Jesus is walking down the street and he says to three different guys, come follow me, and each of them gives an excuse. The first guy says, uh, Lord, uh, I'll follow you, but let me first go home and buy a piece of land. I gotta go close a business deal. Let me close my business deal before I first start serving you. Another guy, he says, uh, Lord, I'll follow you, but let me first go home and bury my father. He's not dead yet, but let me go home and wait till he's, you know, I, I've got some family obligations. And another guy's got issues. They all say, Lord, let me, look there on the outline. Luke 9, 57, Jesus says, come follow me. But the man said, Lord, let me first. And then he gives his excuse. Now circle the word Lord and circle the phrase me first. Because that is a contradiction. You can't, say, you can't say those two phrases in the same sentence. Lord, me first. Because if he's Lord, then he's first. Me first means he's not Lord. So you gotta decide who's the Lord of your life, you or God? Is it me first, my plans, my ambition, my career, my dream, my idea, or Lord, which means your purpose. I want to do what you made me to do. I want to fulfill what you made me to fulfill. I want to be what you made me to be. Not my puny little plan. I want your big plan for my life. You say, well, you don't know how, you know, how old I am or how young. Everybody's got an excuse. Moses had an excuse. Gideon had an excuse, David, Abraham, everybody said, I'm too young to do this. I'm too old to do this. I'm, I'm too fat, I'm too thin, I don't have the right background, I don't have enough money, I don't have the education, and on and on. No, no, it's just busyness. Come, follow me. But the man said, Lord, let me first. What have you been saying me first to God about in your life? Lord, first, let me get married. Let me get a new job. Let me make a certain amount of money. Let me, me first you're gonna miss the opportunity. You're gonna miss the opportunity of your life if you say me first. You will miss the opportunity of your life. So inflexibility, busyness, and the third one is lack of faith. The Bible says according to your faith it will be done to you. And a lot of times we see a great opportunity but we just don't have the faith to do it. We're afraid, we're worried, we're scared. We think I can't do this. 
I don't have the resources. I don't have the background. I, I, too much of my life has passed by. No, you're dead wrong. You're dead wrong. I want to remind you that Moses started leading the children of Israel to victory when he was 80. When he was 80. And I could go through the Bible and talk to you how God has said, no, 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 I don't care what's happening in the rest of your life. The best of your life is going to happen now. The fifth thing I've learned is this. Every opportunity will have opposition. Every opportunity will have opposition. Anytime you start to try to do anything good with your life, somebody's going to pose it. Unfortunately, it may be people close to you. It may be parents who say, who do you think you are? It may be your husband or your wife. Who do you think you are? It may be peers. When you get a vision, a dream from God, say, I, I really want to do it. Who do you think you are? And that's the wrong question. The question is not who do you think you are, it's who do you think God is? You let the size of your God determine the size of your goal. Remember last week we talked about, we can't do this on our own, but our eyes are upon you and God says, it's my battle, I'm gonna fight it. Now, the moment you give your life totally to say, I'm gonna give my life to the greatest purpose in the world, the kingdom of God, living for God's will, God's plan, God's purpose, God's church, I'm gonna live that for God that way because it's the only thing that's gonna last. You become enemy number one by Satan. He's gonna throw everything at you, all kinds of opposition, critics, financial issues, all kinds of things, because Satan does not want you to be a great man. Satan does not want you to become a great woman. He wants you to waste your life in trivia and puniness and die having made no impact on the planet. He'd be very happy for you to sit home and do social media all day and have no impact at all. Every opportunity will have opposition. Paul talks about this in 1 Corinthians. He says this, there is a wide open door, a wide open door for a great work here. This is an opportunity. And many people are responding to this opportunity. But there are also many who oppose me. Here's the equation. Opportunity plus opposition equals God's will. Opportunity plus opposition equals God's will. If nobody opposes the idea, it's probably not from God. It is not by accident that the most blessed people and the most blessed ministries and the most blessed churches in the world are also the most criticized. Opportunity plus opposition equals God's will. The churches that are doing the most damage against Satan, he fights the hardest. And the people who are trying to make the biggest impact, he fights the hardest with all kinds of problems and critics and every kind of thing possible. If you're gonna call the shots, you're gonna take the shots. The pioneers get the arrows in their back. Don't be afraid to rock the boat if Jesus is your captain. And if you're gonna walk on water, you gotta get out of the boat. You gotta be willing to risk lack of faith let me tell you about a couple of opportunities that are really wide open doors for us. No church in history has ever had the opportunity we just got in the last month. And it is an opportunity to impact an entire continent, the continent of Africa. Let me take a minute and tell you about it since this is Vision Week. You know about 10 or so years ago, 12 years ago, we started the peace plan. We started sending members, 23,000 members to 196 countries to promote reconciliation and plant churches, equip servant leaders, assist the poor, care for the sick, educate the next generation. But there's one country we've had a particular connection with because they wanted to build a national model. And about 10 years ago, the president of Rwanda, a little country of 10 million people in Africa, uh, Paul Kagame wrote me a letter. He said, I've read your book, Purpose Driven Life. I'm a man of purpose. Come help us build a purpose driven nation. We're rebuilding after the genocide. So we've sent over 1,200 members of Saddleback Church to Rwanda. And we've been involved in every phase of the rebuilding of that nation through the local churches. We've had three to, th to 4,000 pastors trained in purpose driven training, over 2,000 pastors. Churches have finished um, a three-year program of training there. 
They're doing all kinds of healthcare projects, financial projects, job training projects, lifting people out of the poverty, educating people, literacy programs, uh, just on and on. I it could take all day to explain those programs. But we were also sending federal judges from Saddleback Church to go train their federal judges. We were sending law enforcement from Saddleback Church to train their police forces. We sent nurses to train their nurses. We sent gardeners and landscapers to train landscapers. We sent entrepreneurs to train entrepreneurs. And we've sent accountants to train accounting. We even took the city planner of our city and sent that family to Rwanda for a year where he helped reorganize the entire capital of Kigali and get all the street lights and the roads corrected. It's an amazing thing. And we've seen all kinds of, Rwanda is now the revered country in all of Africa. For the last three years, it's been named the safest country on the continent. It's been named the least corrupt country on the continent. And it is rapidly uh, moving into prosperity. Um, in the last five years, one million people, or 10% of the country, have come out of poverty. That's not a statistic I made up, that's a United Nations statistic. One million, 10% of the country is no longer in poverty. And the Peace Plan has, has a, had a large part in helping create jobs and helping create training and raise the, the, uh, the, the economic status. After the genocide, there were literally million, well, over a million orphans. Now, they didn't all go into orphanages. Some of them stayed on the streets and some of them went into families. But Rwanda's had a, a, a huge orphan problem. And uh, about, I think, five years ago, uh, they came to us and said, we would like to be the first nation to end orphanages. We want every child in a family. You see, at Saddleback, we don't build orphanages. We don't believe in orphanages. In fact, we are against orphanages. Why? Because no child deserves to be put in an institution. Every child wants a family. We don't want kids in orphanages. We don't build orphanages. The answer, the answer to orphans is not a building. The answer to orphans is a family. They all need a family. The answer is adoption. The answer is foster care. And so we said, we're the church. We'll help you do it. And we'll help the churches begin to adopt and do orphan care and do um, 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 you know, foster care and all of that. And this last month when I went there, we're now down to less than 1,500 orphans in the nation. We will close down the last orphanage within a year. That's an amazing thing. And Saddleback, I mean, Rwanda will be the first church, I mean, first nation in the world with no orphanages. Why? Because God's answer is the church and the family, not a building. And so um, I could go on and on and tell you, but the world began to take notice, particularly Africa began to notice what was going on in Rwanda. And I began to get letters and calls from world leaders and other leaders in Africa. Christian leaders, business leaders, government leaders. I've had five African presidents call me and say, when are you gonna bring the peace plan to our nation? And I said, well, we're not, but we'll send the Rwandans. Because we can't go to every nation, but we can help others go to every nation. And we can help train them and do that. And so I got the idea uh, a while back. I said, what if instead of all of us going to all of those nations, what if we brought them all to Rwanda and let them see it? See this miracle taking place. A nation going from third world to first world in about a generation and a half. So last month I invited top leaders from 35 nations to come to Rwanda and spend a week with me. We had leaders from 31 African nations plus leaders from Russia, from China, from India, and from America, 35 nations. And in a word or two words, what they saw that week, they were blown away. And by the end of the week, they were weeping. And by the end of the week, they were going, we gotta do this in our country. And they all committed, every one of those nations said, we're gonna go back and start working on a national purpose-driven peace plan in our nation. And so next August, we're going to do, at the brand new convention center in Rwanda, the first all Africa 
Continental Congress for purpose-driven leadership training. And we're inviting, we're handpicking delegations from all 54 nations. And they're going to come to Africa for a week and be trained and go back and then begin to do the peace plan on a national level in their country. This is an opportunity to impact an entire continent. This is not a wide open door, folks. God blew the door off on this one. And I'm gonna need about 500 of you to go to Africa this next year and help us host at that conference. We're gonna have people from all over the world gonna be there. I'm gonna need people here who help manage, who help train, people here who help pray, who help organize. There's gonna be a thousand different ways, but an opportunity to do influence all Africa. Now here's an interesting thing. When the Chinese heard about it, they said, could we do all Asia in a couple years? And the Latin Americans say, could we do all South America in a couple years? And we're going, this could be big. <laughs> no church in history has ever been given this opportunity where presidents of heads of state call up and say, what you have, we want for our entire nation. That is a wide open door of opportunity. So we're gonna do that this next year. That's just one. I got 10 things to share, but I'm out of time. So let me just say the second thing there on your outline. Adventures in faith is the general overall theme for next year where we're doing a, a full calendar of faith stretching events and training and opportunities. Next year is a very significant year for us. It is the 20th anniversary of the book Purpose Driven Church. It is the 30th anniversary of Purpose Driven Church training where we've trained 400,000 pastors around the world, and it's the 35th anniversary of our church. We don't ever use anniversaries to just celebrate the past. We use them as launch pads for the future. So buckle up, we're going on an adventure. We're going on an adventure in faith. And if you hang in with a great group of people doing a great purpose, you will become a great soul. So I want everybody right now, pull out your program. Take out your bulletin and see this little flap? I want you to pull it out, rip it off, write your name on it, and write two words. The most dangerous prayer, I've told you this many times, two of the most dangerous prayer you can pray is two words, use me. So write, write your name, you say, I don't even know how I could be used, I don't even know what I could do, Rick, I just want you to know I'm in. I want a great purpose, and I want to be a part of a great team, and I want to build a great soul, and I don't think God put me here in this church to watch history happen. God put you here to make history. God did not bring, of all the people he could have chose to be at this historic church in this point in time, he chose you, why? Not to sit and soak and sour. He brought you here because he, you have something God wants to use in you. And he wants you to have a great purpose and a great team and he wants you to build a great soul because what happens in all of this is what happens in you. The changes that it makes in you. So write your name down and write the word use me on there and drop it in, in the basket. Now what I'm gonna do, let me tell you, explain to you what I'm gonna do the next few weeks. I'm going to stop preaching for the next few weeks to prepare the tools and the resources you're gonna to need to live a great life in 2015. I've only done this two other times in 34, almost 35 years. 20 years ago, I stopped preaching for four months and I wrote a book, it was called Purpose Driven Church during that time. It sold a million copies in 17 languages and, it, and, it, and influenced an entire generation of churches. And while I was gone, the church grew by 800 people. Then 12 years ago, I wrote Purpose Driven Life. And I was gone for seven months right now, and that one took me a lot of time. We added over 1,000 new people, but I think that was probably a pretty good use of my time. Because it became the best-selling book in American history, and 32 million lives were changed in churches all over America from reading that book. I don't even know what God wants me to write now. I don't. I just know he's telling me that there's some things I'm supposed to prepare for you for the new year in the Adventures in Faith year. So what I'm gonna do is for the next six weeks, you're not gonna see my face on weekend, and instead of me bringing in guest speakers, I went back and looked through the files of the six messages people had requested me to preach again. Hey, I wish my friend had heard this one. 
I wish my friend had heard this one. And I've picked those out, and so the next six weeks, you're gonna get the best of Rick. <laughs> okay, all right, for the next six weeks. And while I, and I need you to pray for me, because I'm gonna be working hard, writing tools for you to help you, just lay away Purpose Driven Life, and church did, helped you. And as I'm doing that, we're gonna be showing that. Also, during uh, this fall, I'm gonna go visit each of our campuses so that I can visit Saddleback Anaheim and Saddleback San Clemente and Saddleback Irvine and Rancho Capistrano and on and on. Now, there's one other thing I need to tell you. Number six, the sixth thing that I've learned about opportunities, and it's this. Great opportunities bring great responsibility. Great opportunities always bring great responsibility. Jesus said it like this. To whom much is given, much will be required. And to whom much more is given, even more will be expected from them. I want you to circle the two words, much more. To whom much more is given, even more will be expected from them. God expects more from those he blesses more. I hate to tell you this, but everybody sitting here listening to this and on, online right now, you're all in the much more category. If you have any change in your pocket right now, or you have any change at home sitting in a can or a cup or something like that, you are wealthier than 92% of the world. You have no idea how good you have it. If, you, if I could take you travel around the world with me, most of the world would love to have your problems. You are the most blessed in the world. To whom much more is given, much more is expected. And one day you're gonna stand before God and God's gonna say, what did you do with what I gave you? Well, I, I had a great retirement and played a lot of golf. Ah, wrong answer. <laughs> you think I gave you all these blessings just for you to be comfortable? Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? If you think you're gonna sit back and drink mint juleps in retirement, you got another thing coming because I'm coming after you. Okay. <laughs> because you got extra time on your hands now and we're gonna use it for the greatest purpose in the kingdom of God and the rest of your life is gonna be the best of your life. Much, much more. I am your spiritual coach, and the one thing that scares me the most is the Bible says one day I will give an account to God for how well I helped you grow. That scares me to death. Because friends, I'm not that smart. I'm not smart enough to take care of all your spiritual needs, much less my own. So play, pray for me, your pastor, as I pray for you. My goal as your spiritual coach is to one day get you ready to the point that when you stand before God, which you will inevitably one day, and he says, what did you do with what I gave you? You can give the right answer. You may not be famous, but you can be great. You can be a great woman of God. You can be a great man of God. It doesn't matter where you've been. What matters is where your feet are headed right now. Now there's one last opportunity that I, I can't fail to mention because if you miss this opportunity, it's the biggest mistake of your life. Look at this verse on the screen. The Bible says in Jeremiah 8.20 about this missed opportunity, the harvest has passed, the summer has ended, and we are not saved. Are you saved? Do you know that if you died tonight, you would go to heaven? Are you absolutely certain of that? If you're not, I wanna tell you, harvest back, summer has ended. Some of you have been at Saddleback for weeks, some for months, some have even come for years, and you've never stepped across the line. What are you waiting on? It's quite presumptuous to assume you're gonna have every chance and every opportunity. No opportunity lasts forever. It's for a limited time only. And God is saying this to you. I offer you your past forgiven, a purpose for living, and a home in heaven. It's a limited time only offer. You don't know how long you're gonna get that offer. 
because you don't know when your time's gonna be up. Let's bow our heads. If you've never given your life to Christ, you say, say to him right now, Jesus Christ, I need to be saved. I can't get into heaven on my own. I'm not good enough. Heaven's perfect and I'm not. I need your grace. I need your forgiveness. And God, I need you in my life right now. Jesus Christ, as much as I know how, just pray this, Jesus Christ, as much as I know how, I humbly ask you to become the manager of my life, the, the Lord, the boss, the CEO of my life. And I want to fulfill not my puny plans, but your great purpose for my life. You say, God, I, yeah, I wasted a lot of years but I wanna make the rest of my life the best of my life. And I wanna go it with God. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen.